Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry. And today we're visiting in Mondragon, Spain, with my friend Ander, Ander Echeverria Otadui, at the Mondragon Cooperatives. Ander, it's such a joy to be with you, and I'm so happy we can do a podcast with you. It is a pleasure. Wonderful to have this opportunity to share with our audience some of the magic of the Mondragon Cooperatives, but also to demystify the structures, the strategies, the very practical things that you and your community are doing here. This is a very important idea. This is something real. We are normal people. Normal people are everywhere in the world. Why not something similar to Mondragon everywhere in the, bo- in the world? Absolutely. On there, Ichiberia Otadui is head of cooperative dissemination in Mondragon for eight years. He serves annually approximately 2,000 people who want to know about the Mondragon cooperative experience, professionals, students, politicians, and he explains and shares with incredible expertise, I will add, the Mondragon to different universities and forums all around the world. Previously, he worked in one of the cooperatives of the Mondragon Corporation called Ikerlon Technology Center as a personnel manager. And uh, that's for 11 years. And before that, he was at the corporate center of Mondragon uh, in training, right, for seven years. Um, He studied uh, technical engineering at Mondragon University and also uh, sociology at the Destu University in Bilbao. Did I say that correctly? Yes. Okay. And uh, so here we are at Oter Lawn, yeah, which is one of the very important hubs of the entire Mondragon ecosystem. And I was hoping, Ander, to kind of kick things off. You could describe to us, what is the Mondragon ecosystem? How many people are we talking about? And, and, and what's happening here at this hub? We are 80 cooperatives. The cooperatives are in the Basque Country. Then we have subsidiaries around the world, more than 80 in the United States, in China, in France, in Brazil. We are more or less 69,000 workers in the Mondragon Corporation, and the turnover is more or less 10,200 million euros per year. One of the cooperatives is my cooperative, is Mondragon Headquarters. I am member, worker, owner, of the headquarters. And do you know how many people are we working at the headquarters? This is part of the headquarters. We are only 60 people. In total in the corporation, 69,000 colleagues. At the headquarters, 60. Why only 60? Because cooperatives are autonomous. They have their own general services, their own staff. Cooperatives are a kind of companies that are friends, and they are together in the group, in the modern corporation, because they want. If there is a cooperative that is not happy in the corporation, can leave the corporation. This is a very important idea to understand Mondragon. Autonomous cooperatives together. And this is part of the headquarters. This is Otalora, our training center, cooperative and management training center. So managers of Mondragon come here to learn about negotiation, creativity, coaching, and our members they come here to know more about what is a cooperative, what are the values, the way to work in a cooperative. So we have always many people here. Yeah, it's so exciting. And, and I got to say that at least in the United States, uh, we, we tend to like to use the word billion, I guess. So when you hear $10,200 million in gross revenue or euros, um, that's approximately 10 to $11 billion U.S. equivalent in annual sales among all of the companies that make up the Mondragon system. Is that right? Yes. Cooperatives are companies. It is about solidarity and about business. We have to be competitive. If we are not competitive, we disappear. There is no cooperative. There is no solidarity. There is no business. So we invest every year a lot of money in innovation. The only way to continue existing is innovation. 
We're here for a week-long immersive symposium uh, co-hosted by our friend Georgia Kelly at the Praxis Peace Institute. And of course, Georgia has been on the Why on Earth Community podcast already talking about Mondragon. And it is Thursday. Uh, this is a Monday through Friday experience for us. And Ander and I, in the midst of our very busy and lovely schedule, only have a few minutes now at our lunch break to record at this beautiful setting, Oterlora. And we're gonna continue recording uh, Saturday uh, and get into some more of the detail of the amazing uh, things happening here and how we can think about uh, adapting and applying some of the structures and strategies in our other projects and communities all around the world. And for me, one of the things that is so beautiful and, and hopeful about what's happening at Mondragon is that this is a system with an ethic and ethos of taking care of people, competing in the marketplace, uh, expressing uh, innovation for environmental stewardship, for social innovation, for technological innovation, and it doesn't leave folks behind. It's not about a small handful uh, getting extraordinarily rich while so many thousands of people are engaged in the process of developing that capital, that wealth, that opportunity. Instead, you have communities here in this region who all benefit when the companies are doing good by their products, their services, and their innovation. And, and this, this to me is the pattern we need to consider implementing, proliferating, and scaling into all kinds of different companies and organizations around the world. What do you think about that? This is a, a model that allows not to create rich people, but to create rich societies. Yeah. We have a good quality of life, workers, and in general, the society. It is about a good salary or very good salary, a good health system. This is good for us. But then the aim of our cooperatives is to create jobs. So it is a kind of sharing this with others to allow them to participate in our companies, always being competitive because we are companies. So this is a very important idea that the founder repeated and repeated. It's not about rich people, but rich societies. And this is also what for everyone. So wonderful. I know we're gonna get into some of the details. We're gonna talk about the, the, the founding visionary, Father Jose Arzmenda, who has a much longer name than that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the many important principles, we'll talk about this. And uh, I also wanna note that in the 1950s, when all of this got started, this region in, in Spain is the, the poorest region or one of the most poor regions of Spain. And now is the most affluent, is this right, region of Spain? At that time, it was very poor. Yeah. Maybe not the poorest in okay. the, Spain. And today is one of the wealthiest. Yeah. Yes. But we don't see this extreme of uh, wildly large, exclusive, gated community no. wealth here and poverty, ghettos, uh, slums over here. We don't see that. The, the extremes are eliminated, right? Everybody's happily in the middle. It is about quality of life. Yeah. I can be very, very rich, but in that case, I need a fence in my house. I need a bodyguard. I think this is not a very high quality of life. Yeah. This is an old thing. Yeah, no doubt. Well, and so here we are at Otelero, Ote and it is, it is such a magnificent building. And, and the shots with the mountains behind and the verdant green valleys below and some of the villages, some of the farmhouses, uh, what a beautiful setting. And I was hoping you could just tell us a little about this particular building and, and what's been happening here, including with our uh, week-long symposium. This has been our sort of headquarters, meeting place, lunch place. Can you tell us a bit about that, the history and what's happening here now? The building is a 14th century building. At that time, it was a castle in medieval times. Then it was a palace, then a farm. And since 40 years ago, it's part of Monogon. It's our training center. So it is a very important hub, hub for us, managers and in general, workers of the cooperatives, members. And of course, we have also visitors, very important visitors, that 
we, what we do is to share what we have. We think that this is important for the world. It is another kind of company, another way to do business. We think that is good for us and for the rest. And this is the message that we want to show in this building and that we want to show thanks to this podcast and when we give a, a conference. We say, or some people say about us, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Absolutely wonderful and, and a perfect uh, tagline, if you will, for what you're up to and, and, and for this movement toward the regeneration renaissance of kindness, decency, uh, innovation, and stewardship. And so, Ander, uh, it's fabulous. We could record here a bit today and we'll do the rest of our conversation uh, shortly. So we'll piece that together for the episode. And uh, thanks so much for, for joining the podcast. You're welcome. So, Ander, it's so great to be with you again. We started recording our episode a couple days ago at Otolora, and now we're in the town of Mondragon uh, and at your uh, gastronomy club. Uh, it's Saturday morning, and we had so much fun last night uh, wandering around the town with your friends and experiencing the socializing, which is really unique, and we'll talk about that. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we are going to have some time to talk through many of the details and the uh, important information about what's going on here at the Mondragon Cooperatives for our audience. And so, yeah, thanks again for taking the time to visit with us. You're welcome. So maybe just to kick things off, uh, tell us a little about this gastronomy club that we're in right now, because I, I think it's an important example of some of the fabric of the community here in the Basque region. This is an organization, a club for to have fun, to be with our friends, with our family, to, to have lunch, dinner, the name are gastronomic clubs or chocos, and they were born first in the capital of this territory, of this province in San Sebastian in the 19th century, and then it spread in all the Basque country. In this town, there are 22 clubs, and a club is a place to be with your friends, your families, or to be alone, just reading, working, drinking something, and especially, there is a kitchen to cook and to share the food, the meal, with the people that uh, you love. There are 22 clubs in the town of Mondragon. Clubs are organized democratically. There is a general assembly to take the most important decisions. And there is a management board with representatives of the members that take the daily decisions. We pay a fee if we are accepted as a member, and then every year in this club, the name of this club is Amaika Gaste, we pay 220 euros per year. And I can use this facility whenever I want. If I want to have a lunch, I have to go to the blackboard and to reserve the table, and I can be with uh, me with my friends in one table and in another table, another family, another group of friends, and it doesn't matter what kind of people. It can be in the same table rank and file workers, managers, proprietors of companies. This is something common in, in the Basque area, in our clubs. And of course, this is something that is self-organized. That means that we trust in, on each other because if I take in our bar four bottles, I have to put in the computer, in my name, four bottles. Then I'm going to pay through my bank account. It is about trust, similar to our cooperatives. Yeah, yeah, it really is uh, a working, living example of a pattern of governance and stewardship and responsibility that we see throughout the cooperative system of businesses, some of these businesses, many hundreds of millions of dollars or euros per year in sale, very large enterprises. And I'm 
really excited to talk a bit about the different types of businesses that are in the overall ecosystem. But I think that before doing so, I, I want to drill a little deeper into the, the cultural ethos, right? This, this spirit of trust, this spirit of self-organizing, this spirit of egalitarianism. And it was so kind of you to invite me to tag along with you and your buddies last night. Friday night, everybody's out whether it's the senior executives of the largest industrial manufacturing companies or uh, folks doing any manner of, of work, school teachers, all kinds of people in the community together interacting as a community, not, oh, I'm the executive or, oh, I'm the janitor or whatever. It's friends, it's family, it's people who know each other and trust each other and take care of each other, right? I don't know if it is about basket values or it is about the conditions. If we, in general, we have jobs, we have good quality jobs, a good salary, a good health system, well, why not to share with your friends a Friday afternoon, taking beers or taking another kind of drink and then meeting other people that are not your close friends, but they are in the same bar, in the same square, I think it is natural if there are these conditions. Wealth in general in the city. And one of the things that's so striking to me about visiting Mondragon is in addition to the very sophisticated approach to business and social safety nets and shared insurance and, and shared banking and financial services uh, is this, this deep culture of care that provides a quality of life that it seems to me many people in many other parts of the world are, are longing for, striving for, have a sense, ah, it could be better. And uh, here in your community, I experience the, the quality of life at such a high level. And, and one of the things that is so cool about the pattern of socializing is uh, m many, most of the community in Mondragon have uh, intimate cohorts. Maybe you could call them a posse or a gang, uh, a, qu a quadrilla. I, it's hard for me to say. Um, but this is a, a group of friends you hang out with week in, week out, your whole life since like kindergarten. Can you tell us a bit about yes. this? This is also, I don't know, if it is, this is natural for us, yes, it is cultural because it's in this part of the world, but our friends, our co close friends are forever. The group of close friends, Quadrilla is the name, it is born in the kindergarten, in a natural way, and then it finishes in the cemetery. So, we live, usually we live if we are born in a town, we live in that town. Of course, we travel and we pass six months in another country for academic reasons or for job reasons, but usually we are in the area. We are in the area our whole life. Our whole life. So we have our friends since the kindergarten and we meet with these friends every two, three times per week, especially during weekend. No, yeah, we had a. I had a lot of fun joining uh, with with your quadrilla last night and uh, meeting so many wonderful folks as we were moving around the town. And there, it was a, a progressive party, really, going from one bar to the next. And I loved reading in some of Hemingway's literature this idea of the progressive party. And it seems he absolutely uh, experienced that here, spending so much time in the Basque region, eh? Friday is special because after five days working is the first time that you meet that week with your friends. So we have conversations about local things, personal things, but also about international matters. And it is not just meeting your friends, but you are in a bar with your friends and then you go to another bar. And in one bar or another bar, 
you meet a classmate, you meet a colleague of your office, or you meet a relative, and you also have a conversation because always you have something to say to other people. Yes, so it is a, a good, especially a good day, Friday. It seems to me that that kind of community fabric allows for a, a mode and quality of communication among many different members of the community that also shows up in the architecture, the structure of the Mondragon Cooperative system of businesses. And I, I want to transition and invite you to explain to us the what what is the Mondragon Cooperative system? Can you? Paint us the, the picture to help us understand what's going on here and how it's so unique relative to how we see businesses usually organized in other parts of the world. On the one hand, we have cooperatives, and on the other hand, we have the group, the corporation. Cooperatives are joined to a group that is model corporation. This is the model model, both. The cooperatives are worker-owned. So I am a member of a cooperative, I work in that cooperative, and I'm proprietor of that cooperative. It is a cooperative. That means that it is a company, an enterprise. It has, in the case of a cooperative, one side that is solidarity, the other side that is business. If it is too much solidarity, it fails. If it is especially above all Business is not a cooperative. Very, very important, competitiveness. Then, I am member, I am worker, I have one vote. And we vote in the General Assembly, once per year. We don't vote every day. We don't vote every week. For operational decisions, we have managers. And what we do with profit, because we want to have profit to continue existing. An important part of the profit go to reserves, to invest in new machines, new technology, to continue being very competitive. At 10% of the profits, the law here, the Basque Cooperative Law, says it has to go to the society, sports clubs, cultural clubs, non-governmental organizations, and the rest, 20, 30% of the net profits for the workers. And in the case of the members of the cooperative, most of the workforce are members. In that case, profits go to the capital. Because when I am accepted as a member, I put a capital, an initial capital. We have profits, the capital goes up. We have losses, the capital goes down. And I take the capital at the end, when I finish working in the cooperative. This is a cooperative. What about the corporation? There are some rules. One of the rules, for example, is relocation of workers. If I am a member of a cooperative and one day there is no work for me in, the in my cooperative, I have the right to work in another cooperative of the corporation. If there is no work for me in the rest of the cooperatives, I have the right to be trained, upskilling, reskilling, so I'm going to have more opportunities to work in another cooperative of the corporation. And if still there is no work for me in the corporation, I have the right to get an unemployment benefit for maximum two years. This is a very important mechanism that we share in the corporation. And there is another one that is called pooling of results and means that at the end of the year, cooperatives that earn more money help cooperatives that earn less money or cooperatives that lose money. How they help? With money. That means that at the end of the year in the corporation, this is the difference between the cooperatives. We apply this mechanism and this is the difference. We go together. All this is the model on model. And we, we go together reminds me of one of the many slogans and wisdom sayings coming from Father Arismendi, who was such a potent leader and catalyst in the community, helping to create this entire system back in the 1950s, right? 
can you tell us a bit about the, the backstory, the history, how this all got started so many decades ago? Arin Eliareta was a Catholic priest. He was born close to Bilbao, 40 kilometers from here, in a town called Marquina. And two years after the Spanish Civil War, in 1941, he came to the town of Mondragon. And it was a kind of earthquake, a positive earthquake. He met young people, young people whose parents during the war were fighting in different sides, but with Arimendi Areta they were together and they started organizing different kind of activities, sports activities, cultural activities, and little by little the town is changing. It was after the war. In 1943, he set up a vocational level school, the Escuela Profesional, to give training opportunities to the young people in the region. This Escuela Profesional today is Mondragon University. So, 1941, cultural activities, sports activities, 1943, education. And among these young people, Arizmendi Areta is going to identify the most leaders and he's going to convince them to study technical engineering at the university. It was not possible for them because they had not enough money, enough resources to access to university studies. That was the case of the 99% of the society at that time here. But Arimendi Areta reached an agreement with a university in the east of Spain and thanks to this agreement they could study by distance, by correspondence. So they are going to be these young people living and working in the town of Mondragon. Arin Mendiarieta is going to provide them a teacher in the afternoon, evening, night to study. And so they are going to go to the university only 15 days per year to do the exams. So Arin Mendiarieta had engineers. He had plans. He wanted to change, to transform the society, to do a better world. And an important tool for that is a company, because we are working in a company, an important part of our day. And Mendiareta tried to convince the proprietors of the companies at that time in the town of Mondragon to be a fairer company, to put in the center of the company, not the capital, but people. But he was not successful. And after years and years of activism, and education, in 1956, they created these engineers with Arimendi Areta, the first cooperative. And that cooperative, as it was created by five engineers, the name of the cooperative was Ulwar because they used the family name of the five founders. Oh, it's incredible. You know, and I think for some of us, when we hear the word cooperative, uh, we may not understand that while the internal culture is very much egalitarian and very much taking care of everybody in the system, very, very different from how some of the businesses are run in the United States and elsewhere around the world. On the other hand, there is a, an extreme sophistication and competitiveness and not only in the arena of research and development but also in the arena of com competing in the international global markets right and you guys are selling your products and services to many nations around the world to many other corporations around the world it's an extremely interesting dynamic to me to have such a hyper competitive uh approach to the global economy on the one hand and a cooperative approach to the treatment of everybody in the businesses on the other hand. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this because I, I, I think sometimes the, the reality of the competitive advantages that the Mondragon system has may not be immediately apparent to folks not familiar. Egalitarian is relative. I think that we, we don't think that it's so egalitarian, the system. It is egalitarian in terms of giving opportunities to everyone, opportunities for education, especially. 
Then, at work, yes, I have one vote. Another member also has one vote. And we use this vote in the General Assembly for the most important decisions. But during the year, operational decisions are taken by managers. Managers that have been elected by our representatives. And what about the salaries? If we say, well, this is egalitarian, all the salaries would be the same. The same amount of money for every member, for every worker. This is not the case. The difference, there is, a, there is a difference because the company has to have incentives. We have to have incentives. And the difference is not a big difference. If we compare our company with other companies that are not cooperatives, the difference is one to six. So the lowest salary in the cooperative is one, the highest is maximum six. So egalitarian is something relative. We don't think that this is very egalitarian. As I have said, it should be egalitarian, especially egalitarian, about giving the same opportunities to everyone to study. Yeah. Yeah, and just to emphasize the point, a one to six uh, pay differential limit in the entire system uh, compared with many of the largest companies elsewhere in the world where we see one to 100, one to 200, it, it's the one to six is a very significant uh, design parameter in the system, yeah? This is true. If we compare us with big companies around the world, one to six is very, very small. But if we ask, or I ask my colleagues, or some of my colleagues, especially rank and file workers, what about the difference? What do you think about one to six difference? They say, it is a very big, big difference. A very big difference. <laughs> so interesting, huh? Yes. Yeah, things can be so uh, relative, as you say. Hmm. Well, and, and you know, speaking of size of companies, just to reiterate, because I think during our introduction at Otolora we may have mentioned this, the, the entire system of cooperatives is generating somewhere around 10 or 11 billion euros in sales per year, uh, roughly 11, 12 billion dollars in equivalent. I'm not trying to do the conversion math in my head uh, with too much precision, but somewhere in that neighborhood. And that is a, that is a sizable comp uh, company in the aggregate, right? a sizable uh, uh, presence in the marketplace. And, and that is aggregated ac across, what is it, about 80 different individual autonomous uh, cooperatives. cooperatives. Can you tell us a bit about the types of cooperatives and the relative sizes of cooperatives among the 80 or so that make up the entire system? The first cooperative, 1956, was industrial. We are in the town of Mondragon. This is an industrial area since medieval times. So at that time, we are going to create a company. It is normal to be an industrial company, and in this case, a cooperative. So we have industrial cooperatives, and then they thought that this is an important tool, the cooperative model, to do a better world. So they started creating more cooperatives. Not just the people that set up the first cooperative, but there were other people in the town and in the area that said, we also want to do this kind of companies. They are successful and they are fairer. So once and each other, they started creating cooperatives. And I like to say that as the Wright brothers that invented the aircraft, so it is said that the uh, Wright brothers, they didn't know that flying is impossible. Our people, they didn't know that any kind of company is possible or is impossible to create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they created <laughs> agricultural cooperatives, housing cooperatives, credit cooperative, consumer cooperative, educational cooperatives, fishing cooperatives, different kind of cooperatives. Today, we have 80 cooperatives. Four big areas, retail, finance, 
knowledge and industry. And some of our cooperatives have subsidiaries around the world. They own companies 100 per 100 or maybe 10 percent because of an alliance with uh, another company outside. We have more than 80 subsidiaries around the world. These companies around the world, in the United States, in France, in Brazil, in China, they are not cooperatives. And then we also have, for the corporation to function, 23 umbrella companies. 69,000 workers in total. Just making a little note here. Yeah, it's so impressive. And we, we had the opportunity this week, right, on this beautiful week-long immersive symposium co-hosted by the Praxis Peace Institute, our friend Georgia Kelly, who's also been on the podcast previously. We had the opportunity in this beautiful week-long experience that you've curated for us, Ander, to visit many of the cooperatives and we went into one of the big industrial manufacturing facilities, for example. Uh, we went to the large retail uh, grocery store, but it's more than a grocery store. It's, it's kind of got everything like a, like a Costco or a Walmart might back in the United States. And uh, this, this retail grocery store is a sizable company. Can you explain to us a bit about uh, how big uh, the retail store is, how many people are involved, how many stores there are? The name of the retail cooperative, the consumer cooperative, is Eroski, and Eroski, Eroski has more than 25,000 workers, more than 1,500,000 consumer members. They have more or less 1,500 stores, especially in the northeast of Spain, and it is a consumer cooperative that is part of the Mondragon model. That means that workers are members. As I have said, not all the workers are members, but most of them. So workers are members, and it is a consumer cooperative. Consumers are also members. So me, for example, I am member, worker member of my cooperative. My cooperative is Mondragon Headquarters. This is a cooperative, one of the 80 cooperatives of the corporation. And I am consumer member of Eroski. Eroski, the General Assembly of Eroski, has 500 representatives, 500 delegates, 250 worker members, 250 consumer members. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. We also had the opportunity to visit Ikerlan, the uh, technology research center. And my goodness, it was not only uh, an advanced presentation we received, but the, the building itself, the campus itself, had such a feeling of sophistication and beautiful design with many plants and glass and natural daylighting. And you guys have so many engineers in the ecosystem doing all kinds of advanced research and development and serving businesses outside the system and inside the system. And you guys are supplying others like Tesla, for example, in the uh, automobile uh, industry. Can you paint for us a bit of a picture about what's going on with the R&D cooperatives and how that relates to what's going on with some of the industrial co other industrial cooperatives and other uh, customers and clients that you guys are serving in the global market? The beginning is the founder, Aris Mendiarrieta, that repeated that you have to be the best. Hmm. What are you going to do? This product, are you going to offer this service? You have to be the best. You have to be competitive. If you are not competitive, you disappear. So, since 1974, we have Ikerland, the first technological research center of the corporation and one of the first in the Basque Country. Today, there are 13 technological research centers more in the corporation, and they are working not just for the cooperatives, but for every other company in the world. Yes, they are open to do research for any company. And 
this is a kind of not fundamental research. They are not discovering Bluetooth, but it's um, practice research, so especially practice research. They transfer technology to the companies. So companies in this area are especially small and medium size. They have not enough resources to do research. And Ikerlan, our training, um, our technological research centers are to provide them with the technology they need. So if Bluetooth is invent invented, they are going to search an application of Bluetooth for that company. So this is especially what they are doing. And of course, for that, it is not just, just to transfer technology, but they have also to learn about new technologies. So they have many PhDs. And this is something very, very important for the corporation and for other companies. And in our case, we also have the university that is also open to the society. And we have the Mono headquarters uh, colleagues. One of the department of my cooperative, Mono headquarters, is the innovation department. So they coordinate the university, the cooperatives, and the technological research centers. They look the world, they monitorize the world to see what new technologies are emerging, and they also invest, the corporation invest in new te technologies, for example, investing in startups. So it is about being always competitive. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. So there is quite a lot of detail that we can dive into, and, and we have during the course of our week here with you. And you've also uh, produced a, a whole video series to help further explain the landscape, the ecosystem, what's happening uh, within this incredible phenomenon. Um, and, and we're not sure if, if people will have to pay or will have free access. We'll get it all sorted out before we uh, publish this. But can you tell us a bit about the, the video series and um, what it is in, in, in the way of a resource that will help us all uh, even better understand what's happening at Mondragon? Mondragon has visitors since the 70s and since 20 years ago Mondragon has one person working full-time to explain what is Mondragon in the town of Mondragon and traveling around the world. Now it's me, this person. What about in the pandemic moment? There were no visitors, no opportunity to travel, so we decided to do a 22 episode series to explain Mondragon. And we were working two years, meeting workers, meeting founders, reading books, read our books, our magazine, our reviews, reading books written about Mondragon for, uh, from uh, by people from outside Mondragon. We did a great, uh, a great job. Mm. And this job is today, since last year, a 22 episode series. So in every episode, more or less 10 minutes, we explain one topic about Mondragon. We explain also what are the most relevant special companies of mm. our corporation and it is in three languages Basque language English Spanish originally in one language and the other languages sub using subtitles yes and I today it has a price small price but maybe in few months it, uh, it will be uh, free yes there was a debate in our cooperative, in the corporation. If it is free, well, people are not going to valorate, to value. And if it, is, uh, if it has a price, people are not going to watch. So the price is a small price, but we are going to think about that. 
One of the things we love to do, I didn't even think to mention this to Ander ahead of time, but uh, often we'll uh, develop partnerships where the Why on Earth community gets some sort of a discount access price. We'll see if we can negotiate something on that. <laughs> but one way or the other, uh, even if it's the full price, I highly recommend that you check out the video series uh, because there is so much here for us to learn from that is actionable, practical, for our efforts. And, you know, this leads me to, to one of the questions I've been burning to ask all week. And, and, and I see you wanted to ask something first, so go ahead. The web page is exploremondragon. Exploremondragon. Exploremondragon.com. And in our show notes, we'll have that listed along with any other uh, URLs and social media links that, that you think we ought to include. Um, so yeah, thank you, exploremundagon.com. And uh, Ander, this, you know, I've, I've really been burning to ask this. Given the many complex interconnected challenges we're facing in our communities all around the world, environmental and social, what is it in the way of perhaps hope and hopefulness that you, no, you experience Mondragon to provide potentially to the broader world as so many of us are engaged in helping to heal and transform our systems as they, uh, in order to that, they have better, more positive, more healthy impacts on people and on our planet and on how we're treating each other. What is the, the fundamental message you hope our audience takes from this conversation we're having? Mondragon is another type of company. It is a type of company that has a positive impact in the society. Mondragon is not an experiment. It's not something that was created three months ago or three years ago, but more than 65 years ago. It works, and Mondragon works with normal people. We are not, I don't know what kind of people, but normal people, ordinary people. This is an important message. It works with ordinary people. We are doing still extraordinary things in this society because of this positive impact in the society, but this is possible, why not everywhere? When I say a positive impact, is because in this area there are many cooperatives of the Mondragon model, and this is the area that has one of the lowest economic inequality in the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tremendous. And I recall, and I think we may have even mentioned when we first recorded up at uh, Otolora that uh, this region of Spain was among the poorest in the 1950s and uh, uh, among the poorest in the 1950s and is now among the most prosperous in Spain. And this is an extraordinary transformation. It was uh, after the war, two years after the end of the Spanish Civil War, when Arimendiarreta came here, and Arimendiarreta had two options. One option is there are many things to do. We can do it ourselves, or we can wait the government to come here to do, uh, to fill these needs. So for Mendialeta it was also important the quote that John Fitzgerald Kennedy used, that is, uh, don't ask about what the country can do for you, but what can you do for your country? Mendialeta said, we are going to do ourselves. And I think this is the aim always. Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. So uh, we're in a couple minutes going to transition to our behind the scenes segment, uh, which we love to do with our guests. And, and that's available to our uh, ambassador network. And if you haven't joined our ambassador network and you would like to, uh, you can go to whyonearth.org uh, to get that process started. It's a simple process. And uh, you get a number of benefits, including access to our monthly uh, online meetups and, of course, access to our ambassador resources, which includes our 
behind the series segments with our podcast guests. And I want to take a moment to thank uh, several of our partners and sponsors who make our podcast series possible. Um, this includes Chelsea Green Publishing. We're doing many episodes with authors from Chelsea Green and you can get a 35% discount on any of the books and audiobooks at Chelsea Green Publishing using the code YOE35. Um, on any of these offers and deals and to see our ecosystem of partners and supporters, uh, you can simply go to the Why on Earth website and go to the partners and supporters page and we have links and logos for everybody. Uh, but just to be sure to give a few shout outs, we've got also Purium Organic Superfoods, Waylay Waters, biodynamically regeneratively grown hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts, absolutely wonderful. Earth Hero Sustainable Products, Soilworks Biodynamic Garden Preparations, uh, and of course our good friends at Earth Coast Productions who make all of the production, post-production, and tech stack uh, at the Why on Earth community uh, function well. Um, and, and finally, of course, just a, another huge shout out to all of our Why on Earth ambassadors. We are a growing global network of folks in communities all over engaged in social and environmental work. And again, if, if you haven't yet become an ambassador and you'd like to, just go to the Why on Earth website and you'll see pages, uh, one called Become an Ambassador that will get you started on your journey. Um, and of course, I want to mention in addition to the URL to get to the 22 episode video series that Ander uh, put together, which is exploremondragon.com. Um, you can also go to mondragon-corporation.com for additional uh, information. And uh, so Ander, you know, there, there is so much we can continue talking about. Um, and I got to give another shout out to Georgia Kelly and the Praxis Peace Institute and the uh, week long immersive experiences that they provide once per year in the fall, generally September, October, I think next year will be October. So uh, I encourage you to sign up for that as soon as possible because they do fill up and she keeps it limited to a reasonable number of people, not more than two dozen people probably. Um, so this is an incredible opportunity to have a, a direct experience and also to get a lot of time with this guy, Ander, which is a, 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 a total joy. Um, so knowing that we could go on much longer and, and we don't have uh, as much time to do that today as, as we might like, I want to open the floor up, Ander, to you and, and to be sure to say if there's anything else uh, you'd like to share with our audience, you know, to wrap up the podcast before we do the behind the scenes segment, please, uh, my friend, the, the floor is all yours. This is something possible, this is something real, real people with the same needs that the rest of the world. We want to have a good quality of life and a cooperative of the Monaro model allows us and the, in general the society to have this quality of life. Beautiful. It's something special. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today and for hosting us all week. It's been such a powerful, magical experience. Thank you, Eskeric Asco in Basque language. Eskeric Asco. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Eskeric Asco. Eskeric Asco. Cool. Great. Feel good? Yes. Good. You're at 10 five. Thank you. He's also part of a cooperative, but <coughs> it's a cooperative of the same culture. It's not part of Mondragon Corporation, but it's also work around yeah. uh, media cooperative. Media? Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got a, a few. We've got a woman in Kyrgyzstan, and then my friend Artem with Earth Coast Productions building a global network of media companies doing good work. So yeah, it might be good to connect. Yes, Imanol. S What's that? What, yeah. Will he be here for a few minutes? Yes. Okay. So for our uh, behind the scenes piece. So behind, yes. Yeah, uh, turn around. Side. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just dive in and, and talk a, a little about whatever we like. Uh, 
And I, I have a couple questions I might ask you that uh, will help me understand how you got to where you are right now doing what you're doing. Um, so yeah, we can, and I'll do an informal introduction for that. Um, are you ready? Do you need yes. anything? Okay. Let me check if... <coughs> Yes. Okay. You ready? Yes. Okay. Hey friends, it's Aaron here, and uh, we just recorded a podcast episode with Ander Ichiberia Otadui here at the Mondragon Cooperatives in the Basque region of Spain. And Ander, it's uh, been such a pleasure to uh, do the podcast with you and also to spend this week with you. It's been incredible. It is also a pleasure for me. Thank you. And, and yeah, there's so much um, to talk about with uh, the cooperatives and, and you've got your 22 episode video series available online. We mentioned that in the podcast. Um, and for folks who want to join the once a year uh, week long immersion with Praxis Peace Institute, encourage you to get signed up for that as soon as possible. And here we are behind the scenes for our only our ambassadors, right? Um, privileged access. And, you know, I had so much fun last night, uh, Friday night, hanging out with you and your and your lifelong core group of friends. And it was lovely when uh, we were cruising around town, everybody's out and your your daughters coming and going it was nice to meet them they're a bit younger than my kids and uh th there's such a a a, a palpable visceral real day-to-day -day sense of community and safety and belonging and this is something you know at least in the united states a lot of people are really searching for almost groping for uh and and it's like what is it like living in a community right where a lot of folks maybe don't even necessarily have a, a full appreciation of how special or different this experience is relative to other communities in the world and how is it for you as an ambassador of the Mondragon uh, corporation and cooperatives and community to many other folks all around the world to have a perspective that understands hey this is a pretty different experience me, I didn't realize about that, about this community, yes? When I started explaining Mondragon and when I started to host visitors, I remember that one person that came from the United States said, Ander, yesterday I was working in the town of Mondragon and I saw young people, children, playing uh, in the central square and their parents were in the bars. <laughs> and I said, what is strange? <laughs> yeah. And I didn't understood. I didn't understand. And then in two months, another person also from the United States said the same. Hmm. And so I started asking and I started realizing that this is different from what we can see in other parts of the world. And you said yesterday that this, uh, the fish that's, that is in the water doesn't realize that it's the fish, in the, the fish in the water, yeah. yeah. Yes. So it, it is the case for us. If we ask my friends, they are going to say, what is strange with this? So if my job is to explain people from, from outside what is Mondragon, mm -hmm. there is another job that also I'm doing that is explain our people that this is something that is not very common around the world. So this is something, the Mondragon model, the cooperatives, that we have to preserve. But first, we have to appreciate. Mm -hmm. We have to appreciate, then we have to preserve, to maintain, and we have always to improve the system. Because if we do nothing about preservation and improvement, it's going to go down. But first of all, appreciation. What we have in our hands. It is important to know. And for that, it is important to compare us with other society. The mirror for us are other societies. Yeah. And then for the people that are from outside, just explain what is this. Mm. This is something normal here. Why not in your country? Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, very, very inspiring. And uh, oh, it's, for me, also such a joy to be in in architecture in, in a town that is human scale development, right? And and so many of the spaces in the United States are are really, really hard on the body, the mind, the psyche. And I love that in in the river valley here we have fairly high density uh, development in the communities and the towns with the factories, with the advanced research and development centers, the schools, and where we are right now is maybe two minutes from hiking in the woods up into the mountains, which I did yesterday. And I love that you and I both share a, a passion for hiking and backpacking mountaineering. Um, tell, tell us a bit about this, you know, for you and, and uh, tell us a bit about what it's like, your, your connection with the mountains and the forests around here. Yes, this is a town of 22,000 inhabitants in a valley and in this case not in a big city but we have the opportunity to in five minutes be in the middle of the forest and in 30 minutes in a mountain. And for me it's very special because in that moment when I'm in the forest or I'm in the mountain and I feel part of this planet I feel part of the universe and well when I'm in the hills I feel that I'm closer to my ancestors mm -hmm. and this is special. So one thing is to be at home, one thing is to be at the office or in a workshop and the other one is to feel that I'm a human being and I'm part of the universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, I can relate to that. Uh, it was so nice just uh, for an hour or two yesterday to get up in the forest and, and see some really beautiful trees and to uh, feel the cool air uh, beneath the shade and hear we the birds. We have to improve everything, yes, yeah. because if you ask our people, they're going to say, no, but this is very ugly with these horrible buildings and no. buildings and factories are too close. Or, and uh, there is still pollution. Not in the 60s, in the 70s, the river was very polluted mm -hmm. and the air was quite polluted. Mm -hmm. And we have improved a lot, a lot, and we have to continue improving. Mm -hmm. Yes, in that sense. So it's not perfect. It's far from being perfect, oh, yeah. but it's much better than in the past, and it's much better than in other regions in the world. Yeah, this reminds me, you know, yesterday we had the opportunity uh, to go to Mondragon University to the business school and to visit with uh, Professor uh, Fred Freundlich, who is actually from the United States. Yes. Uh, and was he at MIT or where, where was he? I, I always forget. I think maybe MIT, but whatever. Um, and he's been here for decades Yes. Uh, and has married a Basque woman. And uh, I was struck, we, we spent most of the day in the university uh, and there's a series of classrooms, again, with this beautiful architecture, lots of glass, natural daylight, plants, important for learning. Uh, and in each of the classrooms were the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, large format, like as large as the uh, dry erase boards and the screens we were looking at. How is it that the SDGs have come, you know, to be so central to the educational framework here? And how is it that the community through leadership of folks like you and others in the ecosystem are moving more and more in that direction of sustainable development, broadly speaking? The SDGs are in every cooperative. Well, I would say mm. in most of the companies, most of the governments, in every cooperative of Mondragon, mm. the university, the schools, industrial cooperatives, and it is it is uh, it is very good for the planet, mm. and at the same time, it is very good for all of us because we are aligned. Mm -hmm. We know what we have to do. It is not about inventing what we could do, but we know what we have to do, mm -hmm. and this is something that we are doing since a few years ago. And I think that we are improving a lot, but we still have many things to do. Mm -hmm. 
they, they, they are since years ago in our strategic plans in the cooperatives are, and also in the strategic plan of the corporation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's that's so important. Uh, and, and, and it was for me just so beautiful to see that walking into the classroom. Wow, it's right here every day for the students to uh, keep front of mind. Well, Ander, it's you know such a joy to have this whole week with you and to have this opportunity to visit and chat with you and do a podcast episode with you. And, and uh, my friend, I, I am excited that it feels like we've planted the seeds of friendship. And I very much look forward to collaborating in various ways over the coming months and years and very much look forward to, you know, watching and celebrating your work and, and your service to the community here and others all around the world doing what you're doing. And I guess father to father, uh, you know, it, it heart, warms my heart knowing that we're engaged in, in helping to make a better future for our kids and other you know, future generations. So I guess with all that in mind, uh, again, you know, opening the floor up to you, and this is for our ambassadors in particular, if, if there's anything more you'd like to say, or, or we can keep chatting for a few minutes too, if you have some things you want to chat about. We say that we have to give our children a better legacy. Mm. And I was in summer in the United States, and it was, I don't remember in what museum, there was a quote that said, it is not about giving a better legacy, but it is a, to the next generations, but it is about to give them back what they have borrowed up, borrow us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is a kind of, they have given us just for some months or some years this planet, our children, mm -hmm. and then we have to give them back mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a better condition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same for the cooperatives. So because if there is here a cooperative, the cooperative has to continue in that place. It has to continue giving job opportunities. It has to continue creating wealth for the people that are working there and in general for the society around. Beautiful. All right, my friend. You feeling, <laughs> you feeling complete for now? Yes. Yeah? So good to visit with you. I'm very Andre. happy. Yeah, yes. me too, my friend. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Skerik Asko. Skerik Asko. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code Why on Earth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.